Hello YouTube. Today, at long last, we are going to be talking about video games. This is a video that I've been wanting to make for two years, and I really appreciate the patience of those of you that have been waiting for those two years. It took me some time to collect my thoughts and to come up with something that I think is going to be greatly beneficial for you, because we are going to be discussing video game addiction today. And the reasons why playing video game can actually have a negative impact on your life and why I personally will be encouraging you to stop playing video games. But of course, it's not going to be a black and white video. I'm not just going to tell you to stop. I'm going to explain to you my reasoning and I'm going to give you solutions because at the end of the day, Video games are not a great evil, they can become evil if you are not able to control them and they start to take control over your life. It's important that I offer this distinction because I want to make sure that I come clear when it comes to my background with video games. This is not a video by some boomer who's never played a game in his life and who's going to tell you that Video games are going to make you violent and they make you stupid. I don't believe in that for a second. And I perfectly understand that the reactionary attitude of the older generation towards video games is not one that has been particularly helpful. If anything, it has convinced my generation and the younger generations that video games were sort of like a rebellious act in a sense because the boomers don't seem to understand them, and when they criticize video games, it comes from a place of ignorance. I can certify that it's not the case for me. I am quite versed in video games. I have spent thousands of hours playing video games, and this is not a random number. It's an actual factual thousand hours and more that I've spent sitting on my ass playing these games, so I know exactly how they function. I know the experience that most young men have with them, and therefore I have a ton of things to share, things that I believe are going to help you as well, because you will be able to relate. This is the testimony of a past addict, of someone who knows what it's like, who has been in your shoes, and who has managed to actually quit, because I haven't played a single video game in, I think, eight or nine years, and I've managed to do that through certain mechanisms and solutions. Now, I am an extremist, meaning that I renounce them entirely because I have an addictive personality. So I cannot go half and half. I have to quit entirely or else I don't quit at all. You might not be like that. At the end of this video, you might not quit video games at all. But I hope that I'm going to give you the perspective to limit the amount of hours you play and also to understand the impact it has on you. Because... Even though I'm going to preach against video games today, you have to keep in mind and understand that I love video games dearly. It's a media, it's a form of expression that I hold dear in my heart. A lot of my greatest memories come from video games and I have a deep appreciation for the art form that it represents because to me, video game creation is a type of art creation. It's impossible to deny that and some of the greatest creations of the past 20, 30 years were video games. It allies everything. It allies beautiful, stunning visuals, perfect background music and musical scores, narrative, the plot, the creation of a universe, lore. In truth, I even consider video games to be the natural evolution of creation, meaning that a video game can be an interactive book. It can be the next step in literature. But the issue is that with the positives, come the negatives. With the freedom of expression that the medium has offered to humanity has come also a great host of detriments. And that's mostly what I'm going to be focusing on today, because even though I will be telling you the benefits of video games, you don't need to be convinced that they're great. You already love them. You are already addicted to them. So to bring balance to the force, my goal today is going to be the opposite. Instead, I'm going to be revealing the mechanisms behind video game that create these latent addictions which have a negative impact on young men's psyches and lifestyles. Mechanisms that for the most part are invisible, meaning that you don't really see the strings that pull on your fate, on your destiny and on your life in general. And it's the reason why also it is hard to resist. I've always found out that 
If you can manage to explain to people who are addicted why they're addicted, one, they might actually come to realize their addiction because video game addiction is something that is almost never spoken about. It's sort of admitted that video games are not bad and therefore you cannot be addicted to it, which is the reason why it's so severe is because people don't see it coming. They don't realize how much it damages their life. And also it allows also people to understand that these things are not permanent and that once you see them it, it it becomes much easier to actually separate yourself from them so this is all of the negatives of video games that i'm going to be discussing today with you the structure of the video is going to be very simple i will be opening with a general discussion on the genre of video games and its negatives and then we're going to scope down. And when we scope down, I'm going to be distinguishing between the five types of video games that are the worst for you and the five types that are the best for you, giving my answers and giving my reasonings for each one every single time. Because the goal is not to have you stop video games entirely, but rather to help you establish boundaries and also to help you discriminate. Not all video games are born equal. Some are much more damaging than others. And therefore, it means that some of them can actually be more beneficial than they are detrimental. And this means that these are the ones we want to focus on. In terms of boundaries, I want to help emancipate you from video games because I think that many of you have an emotional attachment to it, an addictive attachment to it, meaning that until someone points it out and gives you that distance with the medium, you're going to have a very tough time actually creating that, that freedom that you actually desire deep down. Because I know that many people who play video games, and I was like that, suffer from this addiction. They suffer from the fact that they cannot separate themselves from the practice of playing video games, but they see no solution and therefore they don't really go anywhere and nothing really happens. I hope that this video is going to be the necessary catalyst for you to make a positive change in your life. I don't know how long it's going to be taking, maybe an hour, maybe two hours. We will see. I want to take my time and really discuss this in depth because this is most likely going to be the first and last video about video games on the channel. So let us start with the general discussion about the negatives of video games. First off, video games are a form of escapism meaning that they help you disconnect from reality. And it's the reason why we love them so much. I remember being a kid, coming home from a day of school where I wasn't the most popular, I wasn't the most appreciated, class was tough, I got bullied. So the first thing I wanted to do when I went home was to forget about my day. And so I indulged in video games because the video game was a place where I could be someone else. I could stop thinking about my problems. And that is great. And actually... I am not against that. Escapism by itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can become a bad thing if it's something that ends up just absorbing you entirely, meaning that most people like video games because it's a great way to forget your problems. But if I pointed out another method that people employ, like for example, alcohol, you would quickly come to understand that there is a problem. If someone comes home after their job every single day and they drink themselves silly to forget about the difficulties of their life, you quickly understand that this is an addiction and it's a negative one to boot. But the problem is that because video games don't have a visible negative impact on your physical health, many people brush it off and say, well, it's healthy escapism. I'm here today to prove to you that this is not the case because... Since you constantly go back and revisit video games to forget your problems, you end up indulging in them, which becomes an issue in and of itself. By trying to escape and run away from problems, you create a bigger problem because you start to dodge reality entirely. And I know that it's sort of a boomer talking point of people who say, oh, you're going to end up just plugging your brain to the internet connection and you're going to just wither away and die. It's the thumbnail that I used. It's a very common fear associated with the virtual, but there is some truth to that. The more you are going to, in a sense, allow yourself to be bubbled up by that virtual reality that video games represent, the more it's going to be tempting to continue and to just double down on this practice because it is a true solution to a problem. But is it really a solution? Is your problem fixed once you exit that bubble? The answer is no. And this is where escapism fails entirely in its pursuit of betterment. The issue with escapism is that it's an escape. 
if your problem is a wolf running after you and you run away, you turn around, the wolf is still there. You're not facing your problems. You're just giving yourself respite. Escapism is okay if you need to take a break and rejuvenate, then face the problem. But if the stage where you face the problem never happens, then the portion of time you spend escaping from it stops being rest. It stops being a recovery period and it just becomes cowardice. And it's something that I'm sure many people who watch this video right now have experienced. You started to play video games, again, to, to escape something in your life, but this thing never really went away and other problems started to pile up. Some problems created by the fact that you played video games. And the more this happened, the more you played video games, the more problems accumulated, the less you wanted to face reality. Meaning that you, again, did something in an attempt to not have problems anymore, but now you have more, or worse than that, you have problems, but you've come to just disregard them entirely because they are connected to the physical world and you are starting to get more and more connected to the virtual world, meaning that your life is now entirely better, but it's because it's not really your life. You have created a replica of your life that you experience online. But the issue is that this is not True, it's not a tangible life. And one day or the other, you're going to realize it. I know that when you're in the bubble, it's very comfortable, right? It's your own personal cocoon. You are fully in control, but the cocoon will burst one day. And the problem is that you spent years and years in the cocoon, but you didn't develop into a butterfly. You went into the cocoon as a caterpillar and you're going to exit a caterpillar. You are not prepared for life. This is the true issue with escapism. And it's a widespread problem with young men. Just look at the phenomenon of the no life or the otaku in Japan. What is this? It's men that are not doing well in life. They feel lost. They feel like they're not connected to their community, that they have no sense of purpose. And therefore, they try to find these very things in video games or they escape from the shame of not finding these things in video games, but they don't find them there anymore at all. So they start to become recluse. They start to just again, recenter entirely on themselves and to not allow anything around them to enter that cocoon. But it leads to a life of social rejection, a life of self-hatred for the most part, because it's something that I experienced. I didn't feel good about myself when I had a video game addiction. Actually, I hated myself. And I hated the fact that I played video games so much, but it was the only outlet that I had. I didn't know any other outlet, so that's what I did. And this concerns particularly men, because men have the tendency, especially in this modern age, to be the ones who feel at odds with the wood. Because it looks like the wood doesn't really want you, you are not adapted to the wood, you are constantly in a mediocre mood, you are constantly miserable, surrounded by this environment around you, and therefore you are seeking happiness somewhere else, but you quickly realize that the happiness that you find in that bubble, once you exit the bubble, disappears. You cannot take it with you. And every time you go back into the real world, you feel worse and worse and worse. Why? It is the confrontation between your virtual paradise and the hell that exists in the real world and is constantly waiting for you when you turn off the console or you get off the computer. This hell is never going to go away. It is up to you to actually fix it and make it a paradise on earth for you. Playing video games is not helping that at all. It's just reinforcing that feeling of being at odds with the wood. And I knew men, young men, who were worse off than me in that regard, meaning that they had tougher familiar situations, they had tougher social economical uh, environments, and therefore they really got swallowed up by video games. And actually, I met one of these guys, I think it was four years ago, and the sight of him made me sad because he was run down. He had long hair, he had deep, deep bags underneath his eyes, he was pale skin, he had gained a ton of weight. This was a kid that was on the breaking point when I, I knew him when he was 14, and now his life is four feet because the only thing he does is video games. He's a full-time otaku, he leaves the house once a month. You do not want to become like that, but it starts slow. It starts slow and the addiction develops. Of course, this is an extreme. This most likely doesn't re represent your life. I hope it doesn't represent your life. But understand that because it is possible to get to that point playing video games, it shows that there is an inherent evil in them. And if you are not in control, it is going to be controlling you. Virtual lives cannot, re cannot replace physical lives. We are not at the point where it's possible. And even if it becomes possible one day and we develop artificial intelligence or machines or simulations where you can just plug your conscience and live a life somewhere else, 
even that wouldn't replace anything and in my opinion it would be the in a sense end of humanity as we know it because we would completely surrender our physical existences for purely virtual ones but there is no true satisfaction in it there is only hedonism and video games are a deeply hedonistic type of pastime it's a deeply hedonistic hobby for a simple reason because video games replicate mechanisms of satisfaction that real life accomplishments are supposed to bring you it is why all of the best video games, if you look at the way they function, if you look at the, the, the way they were programmed and the way they were designed, they tend to look like real life, not in appearance, but in mechanisms. You are, being, you are going to get rewards the same way you would get rewards if you did these very things in real life. But because you get them doing a video game, it replaces the need to do them in real life. It's a point that is incredibly important to understand for young men who play video games because it is, it's how video games tap into your instincts. But we're going to get back to that. For my thesis to make sense, it's something you need to understand. Video games are like real life. Minus consequences. Meaning that they copy what would make you want to be successful at, at life, but without all of the problems that come with it, without the social stigma, without the judgment, without the potentiality of pain, without the potentiality of failure, etc., etc. So it's essentially life on easy mode. This is what video games do. It's life without a body. It's, it's a disincarnated life. But you should know, if you are versed in that type of artificial paradise, that there is danger in that. There is danger in being able to exist as a pure spirit in an environment that is going to give you rewards without you putting in actual efforts, meaning physical efforts that you fill with your body. And that, that, uh, that problem, that vice, is the fact that it's extremely pleasurable and it's extremely addictive. Because in truth, you do not play video games to escape your life. You do it to experience it on your own terms and control the setting which sort of contradicts the global idea that escapism is something that we only do to run away from our problems. That is true, that portion is true. But the reason why is vastly misunderstood. You don't escape your problems by playing video games because there are no problems in video games. Video games is a succession of problems that you have to solve. But the thing is that they're much easier to solve in video games. And if you fail, it's no problem. You just start again and you try again and you'll eventually manage. There is no real consequences for your fuck-ups when you play video games. Whereas in real life, every time you mess up, you get punished. You are trying to escape that when you play video games. As I said, it's not a problem, it's a respite, but if the respite becomes your everyday life, now it's an issue. If your work week is transformed into the holiday week, you understand that there is a problem because if your life is, a, is an endless holiday, then what exactly constitutes the moment when you rest? Uh, for me, this makes sense in my head. If you have, I don't know, two days off and five days on, what makes the two days off pleasurable is the five days on. But if you have seven, seven days off and you're constantly idle, where is the pleasure and where is the leisure? There is no leisure and that is the danger of video games. You play them to escape something, but eventually the very thing that you escaped is not even in view anymore because you only exist in video games. And the, end, the question is therefore, what are you trying to escape? Well, there is nothing for you to escape anymore. You have replaced real life with video games entirely. And that's what I meant when I say that this is in reality why people play video games. You want to be in control. You want to play this experience on your own terms. There is hubris in that. There is childishness in that. You are not fully in control of nature. You are not fully in control of this life. You have to understand and accept it. The best video games also replicate that. The best video games are going to put problems on your path that you don't control. But the issue is that you are still much more in control than you would be in the real world because the creation of a video game and the, the graphisms and the environment in general tend to offer an idealized representation of the world, which allows you to reincarnate under which of the form you prefer and also to shape your identity at well, which is in a sense, like the real world again, because that's what life is. 
A life where you put in effort is a life where you can be whatever you want. You can look however you want, pretty much. If we don't, if we don't take into account the biological details that you cannot control entirely. And you are free to shape in reality your existence. But it's incredibly difficult. It's so much more easier in a video game. In a video game, you launch the thing and within five seconds, you can pick the way you look. That by itself is counter-natural to a point that it is not surprising that it would be intoxicating for the human spirit. Who wouldn't want the ability to control the way they look? What man wouldn't want to add five inches to their height? To have their hair grow back if they're bald? To have a bigger dick? I don't know, to have bigger hands, to have bigger biceps? If you could 100% control your avatar in real life, we would all look entirely different, me included, because we are simply not satisfied with what nature gave us, and because it is so long and it's so difficult to change what nature gave us, video games offer a very attractive and palatable alternative, because they give you that on a, a, a silver plate. It's right there, it's very easy to access. But it's dangerous because it truly also speaks to the, the discontentment of the younger generation of men who hate their own life so much that they cannot wait to create a new identity online. An identity, again, that they control entirely. But not only that they, that they control, that they also have the ability to reshape at any point and that is not subjected to the eyes of others. Video games, for the most part, are compartmentalized, meaning that you play them. And if you play online, it's a little bit of a different story, but for video games, it's you with you for you. No one is judging you. And I think the temptation to subtract oneself from the eyes of others and their judgment is also a reason why many shut-ins love video games, is because when they go out in real life, they get judged. I know, again, I can relate. I vividly remember a period of my life where I was like 13 and I had a weird, like, uh, what is the term of that thing? Like, les imperméables. It's the thing that perverts were when they want to expose themselves to children. I didn't do that, thankfully, but for some reason I hated my body so much that I would wear one every single place I went. It was a very long coat that covered my entire body. I had long, greasy hair so that people wouldn't be able to see my face. Why? I hated myself. And the issue is that people saw it, and therefore people also targeted me, and I was bullied relentlessly. And I didn't like that. I didn't like the fact that people got to judge me and make me feel bad. So what did I do? I played video games. There was no judgment in the world of video games. It was just me. And therefore, it was where I wanted to spend most of my time. And that is, again, a version of escapism that just runs rampant. But it's a version of escapism that, in truth, is not offered by something that disconnects you from real life. It's instead a literal proxy of real life. And therefore, there is no wonder that video games would be so beloved by social rejects. If video games did not give you a same level of accomplishment or a same level of pleasure hormones that accomplishments in real life would give you, then you wouldn't like them so much. It's because they give the thing that you desire but are unwilling to pay the price of that you spend so much time on them. But as a social reject, as someone who used to be a social reject, I can tell you that. As I said at the start, the amount of time that you are going to invest in video games do absolutely nothing for your social status. If anything, it makes you more and more of a reject. But because it gives you a second shot at life, or at least you think so, alongside a feeling of power and control, for once in your life you are in control, you fall in love with them. And it's why teenagers, teenage men, tend to be the demographic that is the most targeted by video game addiction is because it's the period of your life where the, uh, the beliefs and the opinions of others matter the most. You have the least power over who you are because you're starting to develop an identity. And on top of that, you have no control of things. Your parents decide everything. They decide what you eat. They decide that you have to, look, to go to class. They might even decide your hobbies, your activities. You are completely powerless. Video games give you absolute power. So between a life where you are just a victim of fate and one where you literally dictate fate, which one are you going to pick? I mean, it's a false question. We all know what the answer is. You are going to go for the one that makes you feel like a god. It's what I call demurge syndrome. 
any type of environment that is going to put in people's hands the power of creation, when these very same people feel subjected by that very power in their actual life, will be one that will eventually replace their actual life. And that applies for every single addiction. It applies for every single one of the artificial paradises that I described previously. But the issue is that this is also participating in a global slippery slope because since video games replicate real life, all of the, the transformations, all of the, the mediocrity that we see seep into real life nowadays tend to also happen in video games. And you see that with the casualization of the, the games that I've been discussing for this video, meaning that they start as replicas of real life. And you might say, well, there is still challenge in that. Well, yeah, you're correct at the start. It's an artificial challenge that makes you feel better by proxy. But one day comes the time when these very challenges need to be tamed down because people who play video games are already trying to escape difficulty. So eventually, at some point, they will require from their video games to stop challenging them as much because they want the feeling of satisfaction as quickly as possible. And it's something that... If you were alive in the 90s, meaning at the boom of video games, and you are alive today, you will have noticed. Video games get easier and easier. They get more and more streamlined. You don't have to think as much. Why? It's because they're copying the way humans are evolving. Humans are always taking the path of least resistance nowadays, so video games are also becoming that. But you understand that there is a problem. Video games suck you into their virtual reality, well, they offer you replicas for challenges that are going to give you the feeling of accomplishments that is completely unwarranted. But on top of that, with time, they give you that feeling with less and less efforts to be put in. So not only do you escape the real efforts and real hard work of life, but now even the virtual reality that was supposed to replace it is lowering the bar. The standard is being lowered with every single passing year. And this is why video game addiction is getting worse. This is why the global happiness of people who are addicted to video games is getting worse. I guarantee you that a video game addict from the 90s had a better life and a better sense of self than a video game addict today. It's because the casualization of the experience also leads to a casualization of the feelings associated with the ability to perform at said video games. We're going to get back to that when I discuss specific types of games. Now to... Uh, to rediscover and to re, what would be a good term to uh, to re, uh, to, oh, man to re scan I don't know to to spend more time on the portion of video games that replicate the feeling of accomplishment. You have to understand that this is on purpose. It wasn't a mistake. Meaning that video games have always been programmed and designed with in mind the fact that they need to serve as a proxy of real life because they are sold to men. The fact that Nintendo created something called the Game Boy is not a mistake. The entirety of the industry is tailored towards the masculine gender. Why? It's because we are the ones who are the most susceptible to it. I heard a lot of times people complain that video games were sexist, that they did not take into account women, etc., etc., the truth is that uh, it's not that they are sexist, or if they are sexist, they are sexist towards men. The reason why women don't play video games as much is because it doesn't tap into their biological instincts as much as it taps into ours. If you want to see things in our consumerist society that is targeted towards women, you can look at the fashion industry. The fashion industry is something that was designed with in mind the ability to addict women. That is a video that I might, I might make someday, I doubt it, but it's just to re-establish the balance. Since the type of achievement system that video games are built around mostly speaks to the basic instincts of males. In most games, you either set out to save someone or you collect resources, you boost your social status, you work on personal development, you take on responsibility, etc., all things that have always been very attractive to men because we know that if we do these things in real life, we are going to get a higher social status. We are going to have the ability to have more access to resources, to have access to women, and therefore to fulfill, to fulfill our biological imperative. But the kicker is that you're going to do all that playing video games. And the problem is that a video game is not real life. 
You can accumulate as much social status as you want playing video games. It's not going to translate in real life unless you are extremely good. For example, you are a top level, level pro player. Yeah, you might get some pussy because of that, which is also insane and speaks to the fact that humans are really not complicated creature, creatures at all, at least when it comes to our desires. A woman will gladly take you in and just offer herself to you if you are particularly good at a video game, even though a video game is something that is not real. But it doesn't matter. I also want you to know that. Like, this is not boomer talk. I know boomers say video games are not real, you're wasting your time. That doesn't matter. If playing video games actually helped you in real life, even if they were virtual, I would gladly encourage you to play them. It's not my argument here. I'm not saying, oh, it's fictional, so it's bullshit. Because if that were the case, the same would go for literature, theater, cinema, anime, manga, etc., etc. That's not my point. I hope you understand that. I hope you're not going to go out with that argument. Uh, I lost myself a bit, but yeah. All of that to say that you are going to chase after that feeling of accomplishment because it's ingrained in you. It's something that you want to do. But the issue is that doing these things virtually can actually satisfy that hitch, meaning that it's like porn. I spoke against porn in my NoFap video and I told you why. It's because when you watch porn and you jerk off to porn, you trick your brain into thinking that you're reproducing. So what happens? Well, your brain is happy now and it dies down. The desire dies down. It's the same with video games. You want to go out and conquer. You want to accumulate all of these riches and social status. You want to develop yourself but you're going to do it playing your video games. And what happens? You can say to yourself and you can tell me, well, I can perfectly differentiate between real life and physical life, uh, between real life and virtual life. But the reality is that it's not true. Your brain cannot do it. And your brain is you. For the most part, you're going to play these video games and that hedge is going to get scratched. And you're not going to want to go out and do these things anymore. It's the problem with most drugs and most escapist drugs. They fulfill a need but they don't really fulfill it fully. It's like, for example, if you were really thirsty and I gave you a Coca-Cola, you drink it down, you're not thirsty anymore. Does it mean that you've been hydrated? No, it's just that something else has replaced the need for hydration. And it might actually be a net negative because the thing that you consume might be bad for your health and the need that was supposed to be fulfilled was a good thing for your health and now you got neither. You got the negative without the positive. Video games are a ton like that. They prevent you from getting things done in real life because you get them done in, done in virtual life. And for the most part, it is the man in you that wants to do these things, that wants to be active, but doing them online or via a virtual console keeps you a boy because these are the things you should have been doing as a teenager to emancipate yourself and develop as an adult. I know I was the same. I spent too many years of my young life playing video games instead of actually experiencing things in real life. And therefore, I had a ton of things to cap catch up on when I was in my early 20s. And I'm blessed in a sense because I gave up on video games, I think, when I was 18, 19. If I had waited longer, I would have had so much more work to do because every single year I spent playing those video games was a year I had to make up on in the future. So be careful with that. It's also the reason why... I believe that they are dangerous for young men. And it's also the reason why nowadays you see so many man childs that love video games. And it's the reason why also video games are seen as an immature hobby. Are video games immature? I don't think so. I don't even think that there is such a thing as an immature hobby. It's just that there are some hobbies that were clearly targeted towards certain types of demographic, but because you fall into them at that young age, you are still stuck in them later on in life and therefore it is only fair to presume that you never really grew. It's the same with anime, meaning that I love anime and manga. But if you're stuck in the mentality that had you loved animes when you were 14 and you're 24 or 34, there's an issue with that. It's a problem with otakus as well. Uh, the anime and manga community is polluted by these types of, again, man children who have never had the ability to take from anime and manga what they needed to grow in real life and they just... They exist only as consumers of it. And the problem with a consumer is that he never becomes a creator. It's all of the same thing with these video games. So I hope that this point is very clear. Video games are not an escape from your real life. It doesn't work like that. They actually replace real life to the point that you're going to pour, pour in 
thousands of hours of your time, a ton of your energy to actually collect achievements that in real life mean absolutely nothing because they simply do not transfer in real life. And he promised that this is les années charnières. This is the formative years of your life. You should have been spending developing yourself and instead you spent developing pixels. All of these memes that you see about the soy boys and the soy boy face and the Nintendo fans who says, oh, my, my wife's boyfriend got me the new Zelda game. That didn't come out of the of nothing, right? It's based on reality. These stereotypes exist for a reason. When you meet a guy who is a big video game fan in his 30s, 40s, chances are he's not going to be married, he won't have children, he won't have property, and he'll have a, a shit uh, job. Is it every single guy? Is it... A general, uh, a general truth? Absolutely not. But there is such a thing as men with Peter Pan syndromes that were directly caused by their love of video games because they were consumed by it entirely. And that is because these games are extremely addictive. And they were designed to be addictive, by the way. As I said, the people who created them Create them as replicas of real life because they understood that that way you're going to keep playing again, again, and again. For the most part, they are very high pace. They have constant engagement, so they always capture your attention, and they're very colorful environments, which are all things that real life is not. Real life is anything but high pace. Most of real life, and you know it, is just downtime. Well, nothing happens and you're just bored and you just wait for the next thing to happen. That's perfectly normal. It's how our brain functions. And it's uh, what a healthy brain is. A healthy brain is a brain that is uh, able to think of nothing, that is able of, of just existing. Video games prevent you from doing that. You have to constantly be engaged, but by doing that also, it's, it steals you away from what real life is. When you go back to real life, it's boring, it sucks. Why? Well, because it just cannot match the intensity of video games. And it's the same with the colorful environments. It's why if you have children or if you're going to have kids one day, do not allow them to play video games until they are, perf they are formed enough and they can understand what I'm talking about right now. All of these kids playing Fortnite are going to grow up clinically almost mentally retarded because it is not good for a kid's brain, for a developing brain, to be faced with all of these colors, all of these flashes, all of these sounds. Because when you take them away from that and you show them something that is just real life, it's boring, it's not engaging. Like I remember a friend of mine he took his two kids that are addicted to Fortnite to a nature resort, to the great outdoors. And it was a beautiful scenery of lakes and mountains. You know what the kids did? They played on their phones. Because to them it wasn't good. It wasn't good enough. But see, this is the problem. Real life becomes not good enough. And for the most part, for the people who are social rejects, it started because you are not good enough for real life. But now the entire logic is, is flipped on, on its head. You escape real life as a coward, you enter the environment that is simply so much better, and now you don't really even want to go back to real life, but it's not going to make you happy. And you know it, this is not the type of thing that breeds joy in humans. But that's catastrophic because the example I just gave you with the two kids addicted to Fortnite that were not able to uh, appreciate the wonders of the wood anymore, is something that many young men have actually experienced themselves because for a lot of teenagers, video games are a very important part of who they are. If anything, it is part of the culture. Back in the days, this portion of the culture was occupied by sports or hobby. Kids would go fishing, they would play chess, they would be playing ba baseball almost obsessively. Now this has been replaced by something else. You have to keep that in mind. It's a truth and it's a reality that hurts, but it's, it's a fact. I know that for me, I spent thousands of hours playing video games when I was a kid and I look back and think, man, I should have been doing something else. Why wasn't I outdoor? Why wasn't I with friends or learning something or reading books? And the answer is because I lived in an environment that was not con conducive to that. <clears throat> if you live in a big city, I'm not surprised that you might be addicted to video games. The outdoor activities in big cities are not that great. For children, it's not even that safe. So you do the next best thing, which is you try to escape playing video games. But it stunts your growth for the years to come because this is the period when your identity is supposed to develop. 
But instead of spending it developing yourself, you spend it again developing something on a console somewhere. You develop a character, an avatar that is not you. This is the time period where you are also supposed to start to emancipate yourself from the world of dreams. It's when you're supposed to grow up, quote unquote. Now, I also understand that this is boomer talk. By grow up, I don't mean to stop being a, 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 a passionate kid. We all have a kid inside us, right? Look at this channel. I cover anime. I'm passionate about anime. Why? It's a childhood's passion. But it's not the entirety of my fucking identity. It's not all that I do and think about. And even when it comes to that type of media, the way I relate to it nowadays is major. It's fit for my age. I'm not stuck at the level I was in 10, 15 years ago. It's the same with video games. I know men, grown ass men with families and jobs who play video games. I'm not telling you that if you play video games, you're a loser. None of that. This is not a judgment of value I'm trying to impress upon you. What I'm saying is that that type of men, respectable and actual functional, functional and productive men, have a different type of relationship with video games. And it, and it is because it is not part of their identity. It's not all they are. I know men who you can define by the video games they play and that's it. And this is a very typical of addiction. Addicts tend to make the drugs that they love into a part of their identity because it eventually replaces them entirely. It's the same with video games. You don't really live in real life anymore and therefore it is no surprise that the video game that you spend so much time playing would become a part of you. But that part of you could have been something else, something much more interesting. So, this is the emancipation, this is the world of dreams. It is fine to dream, it is fine to live in the world of imagination, but at some point you have to grow up, not to give up on your imagination, but to reduce the space it takes in your heart. When you're a kid, it's perfectly fine. I do believe that it's healthy for a young child to live in the world of imagination and to believe in magic for a certain period of time. But at some point, this regresses. And usually it naturally regresses. You don't even have to force it on the kid. The kid eventually gets tired of it. But video games make it so that you never get tired of it. Because they incarnate the desires that you have in the physical realm, but they allow you to experience them in the virtual environment. And so they give you an outlet to experience the same feelings that you desire without the risk of catastrophic failure. I'm sort of repeating myself, but it's the point I was making previously. It's important to keep that in mind. Because they are truly an outlet and video games are truly a proxy. And the fact that, again, there is no risk of failure is very important as well. See, the reason why many people don't take risks in your life or they don't attempt anything is because they're afraid of failure. They're afraid of it not working out. But if you take away the risk of failure, now people become much more cavalier. When you put a safety harness around someone, suddenly they are going to climb up a wall with much more confidence. The issue is that you're not really climbing up a wall when you play video games. Yes, there is no failure possible, there is no risk, but it's because there is no attempt. Playing video, game, it, video games is not a true attempt, but it's going to make you feel that way. And very often as well, um, and it's what I was speaking about when I discussed the casualization of video games, the game itself will start adapting to the players instead of letting the players adapt to the game, leading to the development of mediocre man-child, as the real world doesn't work like that. It ties down to what I said previously with the Peter Pan syndrome. Uh, the real world is full of problems. It's full of things outside of your control, but that's great because it teaches you a valuable lesson. And the valuable lesson is that you are not always in control. You should strive to develop yourself to the point that this stops being a problem and you develop the resilience to face that because it never ends, right? If you're young and you're developing and you think, oh, I hope at one point this stops and I just control everything. Well, plot twist to me, it's not going to happen. Life is always an endless accumulation and succession of waves that hit you. You do not see the waves coming. You cannot stop the waves. And some of them are going to send you tumbling. But that's life. You stand back up and you do it again. The problem is that video games, for the most part, are calm seas. There is no waves. Or if there is a wave, it's one that you decided to face. Meaning that it's like an artificial pool. These are not real waves. They're not really in the sea. It just gives you the sentiment of being there. 
And become, because video games get easier and easier, the waves get smaller and smaller, and it adapts to you. Right? If I toss you in a pool and you no, don't know how to swim, if I reduce the water down to your knees, that's not real life. I'm just lowering the bar to make sure you don't drown. Now, keep in mind one, th one thing. Most people addicted to video games cannot swim. Most of them are social rejects. And I'm, I'm speaking about like actual like deep set down addiction, okay? Not someone who might just enjoy video games here and there. And therefore, because you are going to be tossed in the same type of pool with that type of player, even if you're someone with the potential to be a very strong swimmer, you are treated the same way they are treated. The bar is just as low for you. So guess what's going to happen? You're going to start losing the ability to swim. And this is why video game addiction and video games in general have a global negative effect on the youth is because they work in that fashion, right? They normalize and they do what we call in French, le nivellement par le bas. They create and they breed mediocrity by allowing you to be mediocre. Real life punishes the fuck out of you if you're mediocre for the most part. It's the reason why you try to escape real life in the first place. Because video games don't make you feel that way. How many people derive a sense of superiority or a sense of self from their ability to play video games well? Bro, it's a video game. It means nothing. Again, unless you're a professional and you make money out of it, you are simply deluding your own ego into thinking that what type of skills you have developed playing these games matter. It doesn't matter. It is just turning you into a mediocre man-child that is not going to be able to survive real life. And you have to keep in mind that the real world is not like that. The real world is not a bell curve. The real world, and I'm talking about nature here, not societies, because societies have started to do that as well. The real world is not going to look at you and think, okay, you're struggling, I'm going to make the standards easier for you so that you can actually manage. No, no, no. That's not how life functions. Life is tough for everyone, and if you don't manage, you don't manage. Fuck it, you die. It's natural selection. Video games are the exact opposite. Video games function as virtual selection, aka no selection at all. All right, let's see how much time we have left. <clears throat> Excellent, we are on track. So, <clears throat> with all of these things said and the psychology of video games described, it is now ta time to move to the physical aspect of it because I sort of discussed it, discussed it in passing and it's sort of something that you should also know by now, but you are not physically active when you play video games, right? It's, it's a pastime that exists entirely in the spiritual realm, meaning that it's only virtual and it's something that you do as a pure spirit. But this also means that playing video games by default is extremely catabolic, meaning that it's the enemy of muscle, it's the enemy of fitness. You spend hours completely immobile staring at a screen, Therefore, you deter it. In truth, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's true for old people. It's also true for video game addicts. I'm sure that if we actually ran studies on people who play video games, obsessively we would find out that they have a lower muscle mass. And that's normal. You build muscle mass by moving. Muscles develop and maintain by moving. If you spend four hours like this, not moving at all, guess what's happening? You are slowly shrinking. And therefore, of course, it's not very anabolic. Uh, often also, you don't see time go by. That's the problem with addictive uh, stimulus like video games and the type that they provide. They're so great and they're so engaging that you're just going to get sucked in. And I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about because I'm the same way. And this is the reason why, by the way, I had to quit. It's because for me, I cannot just play 20 minutes. That, that's that's a, That's... It's a farce, right? There's no 20 minutes. I will be playing until I have a headache and I cannot play anymore or until my eyes cannot stay open. I used to play for 12, 13, 14 hours a day. I remember being a kid, and by kid I mean being in middle school, my holidays would consist of me waking up at 8 a.m., playing from 8 to, I think, 8 p.m., so from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., my mom would come back at 8.20, so I would turn off the computer, she would come in, I would spend an hour with her, and then say, oh, I haven't played video games all day, can I play? And she would say yes, I would play again until midnight, go back, and rinse and repeat. I played it like it was my fucking job, I had no limit. 
And I know that many of you watching are like this. You are not able to just play two hours. You're going to play until you cannot play anymore. You spend your entire nights playing video games. You don't sleep as much because of, of it. Why? You might have an ad addictive personality like I have, but it's mostly because it's the way video games are. Video games are designed like that. They are designed to keep you engaged because they require you to play them again and again and again. And so... You lose time, you waste time, because it's time wasted when you're immobile and do nothing. You often forget to hydrate yourself, you don't drink as much as you could, or you don't eat. How many people, how many of you, if I plug you in front of a laptop or in front of a TV and you play video games, you will even forget your biological functions. I'm like that. You plug me in front of anything, and it can even be something that is not video games, like walk. If I edit a video, I can do it 12 hours. I will not fall hunger, I will not fall thirst. Because my mind is so focused that I don't feel my body anymore. But how conducive do you think that is to developing a big and ripped body? It's not. It's the enemy of it. It's the antithesis of it. You also have people who are the opposite and who are going to mindlessly snack on junk food and sodas playing video games because it's sort of a spot for the territory, right? You are going to play a game, you're going to drink a soda. You're going to have a, a bag of chips. Keep in mind that negative habits tend to go in pairs. People who smoke tend to have their morning coffee with the cigarette, or people who drink a lot will start to smoke or do another type of drug as they down their paint. Why? The pairing, right? Psychologically, this is an incredibly strong syndrome that, rep that is re over recurrent uh, within humans. It works also for positive habits, but for video games, for many people, if they play video games, they will be drinking Coca-Cola, for example, or they will be sneaking a sneaker here and there. All of that piles up, all of that adds up, all of that is extremely catabolic. And all of that is also the, the reason why you're missing out on something else, because since these video games and the habits, the, the destructive habits that they breed, tend to be so engaging and fun and pleasurable, because it is deeply pleasurable, you are going to, at some point, also sacrifice other things. So your social life, your sleep, your diet, your training. How many of you have actually uh, skipped a day of training because you were playing a video game? By show of hands, I mean, don't be ashamed, I know you have, but the issue is that it's bad, and you need to know that it's bad. How many missed family reunions? How many didn't spend time with their dogs or their friends because they wanted to play a video game? You are sacrificing time in the real world with real people for time spent with pixels. And that is something that you should come to realize is, at some point, going to be a regret in your life. You will regret it. I deeply regret the time I spent playing video games. I do. I look back and I think, Jesus, if only I could jump in a time machine and kick the shit out of me. Why was I wasting so much of my time? And I know why. It's because it was comforting to me. It was my own personal reclusion. It was my retreat from the real world. But as I've already explained, it doesn't help. I was saved by the fact that I was forced to stop video game. I didn't have a, a chance. I was put in a situation where I had to quit. But it's by quitting that I realized what it was doing to my life. If I had never had the chance to quit, I was never forced to quit, I might still be addicted to this day. And guess what? If I were still playing video game today, this channel wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be muscular. I would be either overweight or extremely skinny like I used to be. And this video wouldn't exist. So again, I come as a survivor. I come to you as someone who was saved and I hope I can save your ass as well. And that leads also to stereotypes, uh, because what I just described, the skinny nerd or the overweight otaku, all of that is insulting, yes, but it's also true. Stereotypes, for the most part, are based on reality. The image of the guy who, again, has greasy hair, bags under his eyes, who doesn't sleep properly, etc., who is antisocial, is there because a lot of gamers are like this, and it's because the medium they engage in is like that. Look at soccer players, look at the jocks. Why are the jocks popular? Why are they muscular? It's a fruit of their environment. They look like that because of what they do. You look like a skinny dweeb because you live the life of a skinny dweeb. Now we're dealing into the topic of lifestyle. Video games tend to make up for... They, they tend to actually make a big part of terrible lifestyles. They rhyme with unhealthy lifestyles. 
And so if you want to better your life, if you want a better body and a better connection with your wood and with yourself and to be happy with who you are, a big part of that is going to be quitting video games. I know it doesn't sound good to hear. I understand that you are emotionally attached to them, but keep in mind one thing. They are a crutch. Uh, sad story time. I used to know a guy who got hit by a truck and he was on a wheelchair. And one day I was shocked to see him walk because in truth, he wasn't paralyzed. It's just that he had to go through rehab to be able to learn how to walk again without the wheelchair. And it was too painful for him. So he, stu he stuck with the wheelchair. But this also meant that the wheelchair had become his own prison. Because he had the comfort of relying on the wheelchair, he never actually learned how to walk. Because you have the comfort of relying on video games, you're never going to learn how to live. And that is a tragedy. So you're going to have to cut the cord by yourself. You're going to have to quit video games by yourself. And if you're someone who suffers from mental illnesses, it's especially true in your case. Because for people with depression, the boost in endorphins that the screen is going to provide can lure you into a downward spiral of you playing video games, feeling more depressed, but coming in to get your kick of endorphins from the video game that doesn't make you feel better because that's not how you fix depression. And so you're stuck in that cycle and your depression gets worse and worse and worse. Again, mental health amongst uh, video game addicts and video games aficionados tend to not be the, base, the best. It's the same for people with ADHD. Video games greatly reinforce your lack of focus. It's the reason why I also think we can pin the resurgence or the operation of more ADHD cases within the youth of today on video games. If you plug a kid in front of a screen when he's three, no fucking wonder he's not going to be able to focus on the math class when he's seven. You have hyped up his brain with bright colors and noises and cartoons of explosions ever since he was a baby, and now you expect him to pay attention to a blackboard with numbers on it and a teacher that is boring. It's not possible. It's not going to happen. But all of that was not within the self. It was not biological. It was purely environmental. Video games make up for a toxic environment, a toxic social environment around you. And when it comes to social interactions, it also must be pointed out that video games can replace them entirely. Video games can become your new best friends. I remember again playing these games and thinking, man, this is where love is. Like, this is where I got most of my positive interactions. This is where I got most of my talking time within the day. And I really, in, in truth, only spend time one-on-one -on -one with my screen. But in my brain, it made up for it. I didn't realize that it was leaving me stunted because when it was time to re-enter the real world, I was a fucking klutz. I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't hold eye contact. I was awkward. Where do you think all of that social anxiety is coming from nowadays? Where do you think all of that awkwardness of teenagers, of teenage boys who say they cannot talk to girls anymore comes from? It's the fact that you've never practiced. If you had grown up playing soccer or playing, I don't know, any type of games, of social games with girls your age, even boys your age, you would be able to relate because you would know their language. You would know how to speak to them. The only language you know is that of the video game that you play. So you're really good at your video game. I don't doubt that. But when it comes to talking to actual humans, you are entirely stunted and you are left with, again, social anxiety, which was created by your habits and no friends group. How many people do you have in your life right now speaking? If you play all of these video games, how many close friends do you have? And how many of them did you meet on these video games? The answer is, for the most part, too many. And that's what I call the Twitch paradox. I'm sure you all know what Twitch is. It's a streaming platform. The Twitch paradox is the idea that Twitch is a group of people that are all connected with one another, but who are in reality alone. The ability to be part of a group online like this makes you think you're part of a community, but in reality, you are truly not. You are by yourself, but your brain again is not able to see that. It's video game. It's the problem with video games as well. Again, they function as a perfect proxy. And the issue with proxies is that until they are pointed out, you are not able to actually see them for what they are. Also, the Twitch paradox works on a second level, the level of Social accomplishments and social status. Um, it's something you see a ton with addicts as well. 
for example, people who smoke weed, if you tell them that weed is bad for them, they'll point out to someone who is very successful and openly smokes weed and they'll say, well, look at him, he's doing well. That, of course, is completely fallacious. It's, it's, it's dishonest intellectually, but video game addicts do the same thing where they're going to spend hours watching their favorite streamer thinking, okay, he did it, he managed to make a living out of it, he's very popular and charismatic, so what I'm doing myself is also justified. All of the hours I'm putting in these video games will pay off eventually. Plot twist, they won't. To make a living and to do something out of your video game passion and addiction, you must be at least top 1,000 Twitch streamers in your country, which represents 0.001% of all Twitch streamers, aka you're not going to make it. So stop justifying destroying your life by thinking that you're going to, to score a great bounty down the line you won't. It's again the Peter Pan syndrome and the child in your head that is speaking, that still thinks that the dream is real. The dream is not real. These people you watch on Twitch are living the dream, if what they're saying is the truth, but it's not accessible to you. And in reality, the reason why they are so popular is because they are making you think, and it's not conscious on their part for the most part, it's just something that they do unconsciously, but they serve as an example of the potential pursuit of success that exists and resides within video games that is a sham in truth. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But it connects directly to the very idea that video games are parasocial by nature. Because any type of social interactions you gather on the internet or playing video games is fake. It's false. And I'm not saying that it's, it's bad or fabricated. Meaning that just because it happens on the internet doesn't mean that it's not real. But it's not real. You know what I mean? Like, the guy that you speak to that lives in Peru and you live in Japan, yeah, he might be your online friend, but how real is that relationship compared to a physical relationship? And I know what you might tell me. You might tell me that the people that you know in real life constitute your fake relationships, that your best relationships you have online. I was the same. My best friend I had on video games, but guess what? They were not really my best friends. It's just that in comparison to the shitty ass friends I had in real life, they were better. But they did not constitute a golden standard. You have, in a sense, fallen for the mediocrity of social interactions you get in the internet because it's always so much better than what you get in real life. But keep in mind, you could get so much better. You could have so much enrichment coming your way in real life with real people, if you actually ditched all of the parasocial that the video games and the internet are feeding you. And it's a problem that doesn't just concern video games, by the way. I won't spend too much time on it, but it's the great plague of our time. Video games and the internet link up people, but they also isolate you greatly. Again, the Twitch paradox. You think you're part of a group. You Even this fucking video, you watch this video and you think, oh, I'm part of the... And it's channel and we're all together in this. You're, we're not really all together in this. You're by yourself. I can do as much as I can to help you, but at the end of the day, it depends on you. No one is going to save your ass. This community is only there and only exists to help you go forth, but it's not going to push you. Like, we're not a wheelchair. The goal is not to be your wheelchair or your crutch. It's just to teach you how to walk. And not even that, just to motivate you to do so. I'm going into territories that are not really related to the video, but it's what all of this, this machina machination of parasocial relationships has put into people's mind. We have never been more isolated than with the internet. Even though it's supposed to connect the world together, people have never been more alone. It's also true for phones and social media. I have a, an anecdote to share with you. Something that greatly saddened me as I grew older. <clears throat> so, when I was a kid, and I used to go to the mountains where my family resides in Europe, we used to have afternoons as family gatherings, and we would connect with one another. We would tell jokes, we would have a good time, we would play table tennis, it was great. And it took place at a certain restaurant that we loved. And I remember a few years ago going back to that place that I had left for many, many years, going back to the restaurant and expecting to have the same experience. And I was immediately saddened by the realization that what used to be people connecting with people was now people connecting with phones because that restaurant was one of the rare places in the mountains where there was Wi-Fi and therefore everyone was on their phone or their laptop and no one was actually connecting. Instead of looking at people in the eyes, people looked at screens. And 
it's it shattered my heart a bit because I know that this is not something that is going to come back. That is gone. That connection with people is gone. Look at people in real life around you. Everyone is on their fucking phone. I'm at the DMV. I'm at even the beach. I am the only human that looks forward, that looks around. Everyone is like this. This is a devolution, right? It's But it's because it's addictive, right? The screens and the constant stimulus and all of that is, of course, something that draws humans and that convinces humans they're connected. Look at the people who have Instagram and Facebook and who think that they are, uh, uh, they are children of the world. They're children of nothing. They're by themselves. Uh, the Instagram and the Facebooks make you feel better about your own loneliness. How many of your Instagram followers, how many of your Facebook friends can you count on? If you call them tomorrow and ask for help, the answer is zero, almost none. Why? These are not real friends. And that's what I was trying to impress upon you when I spoke about the difference between a real and a parasocial relationship. It simply is not the same. We have never been more connected and paradoxically, we also have never been more alone. And if you play video games, I'm sure that deep down in your chest, it's a feeling that you share. You have to be true with yourself. This feeling is real, all right? The fabrication of social interactions is not real. It's a camouflage that is making you feel better about it. Video games and the internet can provide the semblance of social interactions, but they cannot replace physical relationships. The only thing they can do for you is they can help you create a virtual utopia that unplugs you from life and turns you into a pure spirit, which is great if you are the type of person who hates your body, because if I give you the option to renounce the body, you will take it. But the problem is that this is also the death of the soul eventually, and it helps perpetuate your alienation. If you're a social reject, no amount of interactions on the internet is going to change that because you're trying to apply a tangible situation in the virtual realm, hoping it's going to have an impact on the physical realm. And it simply will not. So this is this for the general discussion on video games, the general danger and negatives surrounding video games. As you can see, I'm quite hyperbolic. I generalize a ton. I know that some of you are going to come out and tell me NH, I'm not that addicted, like the things you describe, I think are a bit extreme. I think it's a little bit unrealistic. You are correct. Some people are going to relate. Some of you that have been as addicted as I used to be will relate to what I say. What I want you to do is to open up your mind to the possibility that portions of what I say apply to you, even if it's not as extreme, even if the negative is not as pregnant. Because you might still have been suffering from some sort of video game addiction to an extent or another. You might be someone who's addicted to their phone and all of that comes from the mechanisms I described. So allow yourself to accept the idea that even if this doesn't apply to you 100%, you might still be concerned because it could prevent you from falling deeper down the rabbit hole down the line and to actually sever the connection you have with these mediums as early as possible which is something I wish I could have done. I couldn't. I'm trying to make sure that you can. So this is that for this portion of the video. Now we are going to move on to the five types of video games that are the worst for you and the five types that are, I believe, the least detrimental with, at the end, a conclusion and a general guideline of what I perceive to be the best choice for young men who want to know what to do with their video game addiction and who want a solution. They want to be able to go in a different direction. And thankfully, I have went that direction. It saved my life. It made me a much better existence. And therefore, I will be able to share it with you as well. Welcome to the second part of this video about why you should stop playing video games. If you are here, I assume you watched the first part. If you haven't and you just want to hear about the five types of good and five types of bad video games, I want you to keep in mind that the points I'm going to be using are not going to be very detailed because they've already been covered in the first part. And I don't want this to be too long. It's going to be quite straight to the point and I'm not going to argue too much. Rather, I'm going to give you my reasonings as to why certain types of video games are detrimental and some are beneficial because... As I said in the introduction of the segment, I'm not against video games entirely. The gender, the, the genre is not evil. It's just that 
there is a strong potential for addiction in certain types. And these are the types I'm going to be detailing to you right now. So, top five worst types of video games you have to avoid as much as possible if you are a young man. First one, shooters. First person shooters, third person shooters. These games mostly work as aggressivity outlets, not boosters. I am not telling you here that playing these games is going to make you into a psychopath that is going to shoot up your score. That is mostly bullshit. It is true that the environment and an aggressive environment can increase your aggressivity, but for the most part, it's not the problem here. Playing GTA is not going to make you go outside and run over a prostitute. The problem instead is that it is going to actually catalyze your aggressivity, meaning that you're going to spend it all on the game. You're going to shoot people online and that's going to make you feel better. But the problem is that this aggressivity was not a bad thing to start with. It was energy to be used intelligently. Of course, if you have the choice between maiming a cat or killing people online, I prefer you kill people online. But the vast majority of you are not sociopaths and you would have never done that in the first place. Instead, you are wasting valuable energy playing these high-paced, high-aggro games. So that is something to avoid. It's in the same line of previously in part one where I told you that the issue of video games is not necessarily that they make you escape reality, rather that is that they copy reality to the point where you're going to start to leave them as a reality. It's the same here. The energy you spend online, the mental energy you spend online, could have been spent in real life. You don't have a certain, a certain type of, of, of mental uh, stamina currency that can only be used in video game. Your brain only has so much energy and you shoot it and you, you, and you use it playing shooting games where you pew 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 at people. That's very nice and all, but again, it's a waste. These games also tend to be high paced, which can greatly increase your anxiety or your ADHD because these are they are almost epileptic games, right? Again, coming from experience, I used to play FPS, I used to play Counter-Strike, Combat Arms, Wolfenstein, I, I sunk thousands of hours in these games, I got to a very high level at these games, I know what it's like, you end up like laser fucking focused on this, to snipe this guy, to plant the bomb, to look at this angle, to throw the nade, all of this stuff is nice and all in the game, but it does something to you, to you psychologically. If you're someone who has anxiety, it's going to make it worse. If you're someone who has a, a, a difficulty to focus in real life, it's going to make it worse. So keep that in mind if you are concerned by these type of afflictions. Also, it has a tendency to increase the feeling of meaninglessness of life because you always respawn in those games. See, it's what I don't like about video games as well, is that they they make you lose the taste for life. Because life compared to a video game is boring, to be honest. It's something I already said. But it's even worse with, uh, with uh, first-person shooters. Actually, I have a fun story about that. My grandpa, who is a complete caveman, meaning that he lives in a place in the world where there is no internet, there is no video games, saw me play one of these games for the first time, and he sort of watched for a second. And after that, he asked me, hey, if you want to shoot people so bad, why don't you just go and fight in a war? Why don't you just enroll in the military? And I told him, well, it's because in the military, I don't respawn. And he had no answer to that, of course, but it made me realize later on that it was the reason I played these games. is because I respawn, meaning that there is no consequences to my actions. Okay, you got sniped or you got killed. Cool, big fucking deal. You're going to be back in a second. It sounds like nothing. It sounds like splitting hair. But there is meaninglessness in that. There is nihilism in that. Because, in a sense, you lose, the, you lose the sense of what makes life so valuable. And it's vicious. It's a vicious phenomenon. But it's something that can worsen you as a person. They are also usually uh, articulated around ranking systems that are based off mindless grinds or social statuses. So, for example, the, the video games that I used to play, Combat Arms, for example, if you're from Poland, if you're Polish, I'm sure that you played Combat Arms because it's like a religion over there. The more you play, the higher of a rank you have. But what is that? It's the game giving you a grade, a fucking military grade for shooting people in a virtual setting. That's incredibly vicious. It's 
strange, but it plays off of your ego. It plays off of the fact that people are going to grind, they want that grade. And I remember Turkish players, for example, that would play literally 20 hours a day. They would share the account with other people to have a high, a high rank. For what? It's a rank on the video game. It means absolutely nothing. But it doesn't matter. To the male brain, any type of social status is something seen as positive. So, a lot of, a lot of males, young males, are going to waste their life away achieving a high social status in a video game when at the end of the day, it means absolutely nothing because the ability of this status to transfer it in real life is almost zero. It's not possible. There's also the mindless repetition and farm of killing people non-stop in the game that I'm certain is not the best for your psyche. And also the fact that most of these games are, of course, taking place in a war-like setting and therefore also function as masculinity proxy because war is a masculine endeavor. Men have fought wars for thousands of years for very obvious reasons. It's because we tend to be the one to trigger the wars. We tend to be the one to fight in them as well. That's a discussion for another day. I'm not going to start too deep into that topic in particular, but... This means that first-person shooters also hinge, hinge on their ability to make you feel like a man, to make you feel like a warrior, but it's all in jest because it's not really happening. I think it's the reason why my grandpa was pissed. He wasn't pissed because I was shooting people. He was pissed because I was shooting people in a virtual setting and he saw it as cowardly. And in a sense, he was right. It is cowardly. You're taking out your aggressivity on pixels. It's an important type of rage. A rage should have been spending somewhere else to better your life and eventually be able to control your rage. But because you just let it out within the outlet uncontrollably, it never actually gets any better. How many of you have anger problems and you take it out on first-person shooters? How many of you scream at your screen when you die? How many of you rage? How many of you rage? This is not a good thing. You are developing a temper, and instead of keeping it in check, you're playing games that make it worse and worse and worse. And it also is not making you a better man, because I hate, I hate to, tell it, to say it to you, but killing people online is not making you more masculine. It's not helping you work towards being a more anabolic male. It just is doing actually the exact opposite. It's the reason why little kids like these games so much. It's because they fill you with a sense of power and purpose that you don't have in real life. But because you experience them in the video game, you'll never get them in real life. And also, they are very heavy on cash transactions, especially with cosmetics. We see that with Fortnite and with skins, etc., which is no surprise. They are, this all participates in the endless pursuit of addiction. All of that is put in place to keep you addicted to the game, to keep you playing. Look at all of these Call of Duty Modern Warfare games that come out every two years. They're the same game. It's the same fucking game, but people keep buying them. Why? They're addicted. They're addicted to the feeling that the game gives them. They're not addicted to the game. The game is stupid. It's pew pew pew. Uh, run to A and plant bomb and then use a drone and shoot through the window. There's nothing special or complex about the game. What is complex and special is the way it makes you feel. And that's what is keeping you hooked. So why do you spend your cash on stupid cosmetics and things that don't matter? Because it makes you feel special within the game. And because you have started to live the game as, it, as if it were real life. Just like someone in real life would buy a Rolex because it gives them a higher social status. You will buy a special skin in these games because it makes you feel special. But it's nothing special. The company wants you to think it makes you special because they make money off of it. So that's the first type. To banish. FPS, TPS, don't play these games. Two, I'm, I'm, MMORPGs. Uh, les, les jeux de rôle massivement multijoueurs. One, they are horrible time wasters. I say that in full knowledge of the fact that I personally wasted thousands of hours on my life playing World of Warcraft, playing Dofus, which I regret deeply, but what happened, happened. And I hope I can uh, prevent you from doing the same thing. So these games are time sinks. They are created as time sinks, meaning that the design of the game hinges on the idea that if you're not willing to place hours and hours every single day, it doesn't really matter. Meaning that the only way to be good at these games and to do something with the games is to play them immensely. And because of that, they are extremely, extremely 
close to what real life is. If you want to be good at something in real life, you have to do the work. You have to put in hours. But the problem is that you put in hours to these games just for the sake of putting hours and for the feeling that it gives you. Again, it's that proxy I was talking about. How many people I know wasted their lives away playing World of Warcraft? I know a dude who played 10,000 hours of that game. Imagine what he could have done with these 10,000 hours instead of just playing that stupid game. Also, the investment I just described, the time investment, is l laborious. And what I mean by laborious is the fact that it's, it's scheduled and designed as a grind on purpose. Why? We are ants, right? Humans are very similar to ants, meaning that we find fulfillment in work. We find fulfillment in mindless repetition of things. Some people hate it. Don't get me wrong. Some people actually detest that. Some people are more leisure oriented, but some actually love it because it occupies their mind. Now you don't think about your life anymore. Now you don't think about all of your problems. You think about farming. You think about pulling that pack of mobs and catching the aggro and casting your spells. And in truth, you can play MMORPGs with your brain off. They're not smart games. You don't really even have to think. Most of it is an endless repetition. Which, to be very honest, again, replicates life. Life also tends to be like this, but why would you do that boring thing in a video game when you could have been doing it in real life? Well, the answer is that it's less difficult when you do it in a video game. And also because you have the illusion, illusion of choice. You think that it's your choice and that you choose the setting, but you know that with MMORPGs especially, once you develop an addiction to it, you don't have a choice anymore. You're going to log onto these games against your own will. You don't really want to play, but you don't have a choice. If you don't play, you're going to be left behind. You're going to not have the stuff you need. You're going to lose in levels, etc. So you become a slave of these games. It's the reason why so many people who are hardcore no-lifers are addicted to MMORPGs and not another type of game. Just like video games in general, they also replicate the achievement system that provides humans with fulfillment. So you'll have a quest, and after the quest you'll have uh, some, a little something, you'll have money or a mount to uh, serve as a reward. When you get a new level, you hear a ping, and it gives you that satisfaction of knowing that you did something. When you have enough money in the bank, you're going to get that piece of armor that you've always wanted, etc., etc. All of that is, is bunk. It's bullshit. It's virtual. This is the satisfaction you should have felt in real life when you finally buy a house or you get a girlfriend, when you finally get a dog, you've always wanted a dog and you got a dog. All of that is tangible in real life, you can touch it. But you can get the same type of satisfaction playing video games, it's just that it's not actually there. And that's incredibly important because, uh, as I was previously saying, <clears throat> this achievement system is at the core of these games, especially MMORPGs. The skeleton of an MMORPG is the idea that you're going to put in hours to get an achievement, which then will make you want to put in more hours to get more achievements. But the problem is that it's never ending because MMORPGs get constantly updated, right? We have what we call a mage, mise à jour, where new content is added, a new raid is added, a new boss, a new piece of equipment. So you're chasing the dragon. You think, oh, once I have this, this set of stuff or I have that many pieces of gold, I will be happy. But you know it's bullshit because you know that something else will be added to the game and you're going to want that new thing, etc. A new level is going to be added. You're going to have to grind it. It's never ending. But that's what makes these games so dangerous is that they're not finite. And therefore, the amount of hours you can actually sink into them is also not finite. They also have a tendency to casualize, eventually, which takes the challenge out of it. And you could tell me, okay, this is a contradiction. You're just telling me that the problem with these games is that you sink in too many hours. And now you're telling me that if, I'm, if the game is made easier, it's even worse. Well, there, well, yeah, it's even worse because they give you a proxy for life, which is already easier than life. But then the standards get even lowered when players complain that the game is too hard, so they want it to be even easier... And when it is made easier, what happens? Well, they ask for even more. It doesn't matter that they put, it, put in less hours. It is not a replacement for real life. It does not mean that they're going to realize their mistake. They're still going to play the game. It's just that now the game offers even less challenges. So the virtual bar of accomplishments needed to feel better is, in a sense, easier to achieve. 
and so it breeds mediocrity in people. Uh, most modern MMORPGs are like this. They become easier and easier to play. It's easier and easier to grind levels. But does it mean that the global time that people spend in these games is lesser? No, not at all. It's just that it takes into a different form. For example, it can turn into a casino game. What is a casino game? A casino game is a game where you're going to start to collect stuff. So you're going to start to buy stuff, you're going to collect mounts, or you're going to connect, collect skins. Why? Because the onus of the game has shifted. It's still based on human instincts, but it went from the human instinct of grinding to the human instinct of accumulating things. And it's still the same thing at the end of the day. It still is taking you away from real life. So the two are just as bad. I just consider myself to, uh, I personally do consider myself that it gets worse when it falls into that pitfall. But that casino uh, transformation I just described is also, for the most part, the death of exclusivity. And what is exclusivity? Exclusivity is the notion that in a video game, what is rare is going to be highly desired, meaning that people are going to be willing to put in many efforts to achieve that very thing. Real life functions the same way. Most of the things that people desire the most are the most exclusive, meaning that the least amount of people can actually put their hands on it. MMORPGs all start with that in mind, meaning that they all want to be exclusive. They reserve the top level stuff or the top level boss fights to the best players. But eventually, as I've described, because video games copy real life, they lower the bar and that exclusivity goes away. So the creation of desire has to come from somewhere else because video games and MMORPGs create desire by literally making up artifacts and items and objects and quests that you are going to go after because if you can manage to actually achieve them, it will make you appear special. Once that goes away and no one is special anymore because the bar has been lowered, it's replaced by accessibility. Accessibility is the idea that discriminating uh, uh, between people based on their merit is bad and therefore merit should be dashed and replaced by an ability to have, for everyone to have access to the same thing it doesn't take away from the fact that it's still a manipulation of your desires. Instead of the desire to be exceptional, you get the des you, you are being gifted, or rather your desire for acceptance and for easy achievements is being fulfilled. So, the bar used to be here, it was lowered here, but it still is fulfilling a desire, a desire that you should have achieved in real life, but that now is made much worse by the fact that even in your everyday life, you have went from someone who tried to be exceptional to someone who is just trying to be in the norm. And you were doing it in the virtual realm in the first place, so it doesn't really matter, but it speaks to the devaluation of humans and the mediocrity that the type of video game eventually breeds. So that is for MMORPGs. They waste your time, they are going to, for the most part, not be of any relevance to your real life. And on top of that, they eventually destroy your standards. So also stay away from that. Now, the third one is MOBAs. And this is the one that I think is the worst. Meaning that out of all of the video games I played, MMORPGs were terrible. I wasted my life on them. FPSs were bad also. But the one that left me with the deepest scar and the one that damaged my mental health the most was MOBAs. And in particular, League of Legends. And I'm sure certain that the game that most of the people who are watching this video right now are playing is League of Legends. There are tens, even hundreds of millions of people who play that game. And I can tell you that almost every single one of them is worse off for it. This game is absolute ass. It's absolute fucking cancer. And I'm going to tell you exactly why. First off, MOBAs function as random outcomes, meaning that the game and its cooperative nature creates randomness, meaning that when you get into a game, you have no certitude of winning. And you could tell me, well, yes, it's a game. Yeah, but it shouldn't work that way. Because you see, with the previous games I described, even FPSs, even the ones that you have to cooperate with people, for the most part, your, your kill and death count is going to hinge entirely on your ability to kick ass. If you're a good player, you're going to dominate. There's no way around that. If you're willing to play MMORPGs for 
20 hours a day, you're going to be one of the top players of the server. But the issue with MOBAs is that they don't work like that, because for League of Legends, for example, you are one-fifth of the team, meaning that you don't really matter. You are a negligible proportion of the team's ability to achieve victory, and that has been proven times and times again. I remember seeing experiments by Korean players who would try to win games in, like, gold, meaning that it was a very low ranking compared to their ability to play, and they would lose 75% of their games. Why? Variance. You don't pick the players you play with. And of course, someone who's really good will climb. But if I put a pro player in a gold game with noobs, he should win 100% of his game. The fact that some players can barely win 75% of their games is a problem, because in a game that relies entirely on skill, with no randomness, like chess, if I put a grandmaster against people who are below 2,000 rating, they will win a thousand game out of a thousand game. It's inevitable. Why? Because you cannot make up for the difference in skill. Same thing for real life. If I put a, a heavyweight pro boxer against a hundred like teenagers that just started boxing, the pro boxer is going to win every single match and is going to dominate and never get hit once. This is the way real life function. This is the way a meritocracy function. But MOBAs don't function like this because, again, you have to rely on other people. And this is entirely against human instincts. Humans don't function like that. You can't put a human with four randoms he doesn't know, that he doesn't trust, and hope that this is going to lead to cooperation. It's why League of Legends is the most toxic game in existence by far. It's not the community, it's the game. The way the game is created and designed encourages people to be toxic because... At no point in time is someone going to enter a game of League of Legends and think, okay, I'm going to tr trust entirely that random person that I don't know, or I'm going to listen to the calls of that one person because they sure seem like a great leader. The human spirit doesn't work like that. We're me, 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 me. So cooperative games where your faith and destiny is in the hands of other people are going to devour your soul because you're going to quickly realize that these people cannot be trusted. You're going to lose gains and you're going to lose games and you're going to also lose gains, by the way. And you're going to develop deep frustrations because you're going to constantly lose and have defeats that were completely entirely out of your control. And that is going to breed misanthropy. Look at the average uh, League of Legends player. Look at the, the type of behaviors that you see on these games. People are entirely crazy. I know guys who have been playing for 10 years, they're insane. Like, they are pathologically fucked in the head. Why? The game made them insane. Even people who Twitch on stream and who Twitch the game and who stream the game for a living and who make a handsome living out of the game have to take breaks. Most of the guys I know who stream League of Legends with thousands of viewers, they play for three months at the start of the preseason, then they stop. Why? Their mental health cannot take it. The game is toxic. So that's the first thing. Secondly, the gratification that you derive from the ranks in these games causes immense frustration in case, case of defeats. Because if I give you like a platinum rank and you lose so many games, you end up in gold. Your spirit and your mind is not going to tell itself, okay, well, I'm in gold, it's not too bad. You're going to think, hey, I used to be plat and now I'm gold. This sucks. This frustration is what is making people miserable because no one likes to lose. No one likes to see all of what you worked with disappear in thin air, but it's out of, out of your control. And I want you to know one thing. As someone who has studied the psychology of video games, especially League of Legends, it is actually by design. The frustration you feel when you lose a game is by design. Video games and Riot, for example, the company that works for Tencent that actually makes League of Legends, hire psychologists to study the way the players interact with their video game. And you know, you know what they found? They have found that the best way to keep people playing the game is to frustrate them, which is paradoxical in a sense, but is a method that casinos also employ. The casino doesn't want you to lose too much. They want you to win just enough so that you're tantalized and you play more and more and more. If a guy comes into the casino, he loses three hands of blackjack and he, and he, he exits the casino, he lost $80. But if you manage to get him to win like 15 hands, but he loses 100, now he lost so much more money. 
It is the same with League of Legends. And this translates into the algorithm. Anyone who played the game knows that when you tag for a game of League of Legends, an algorithm is going to place with different people. It is what is known as the matchmaking system. The thing is, this matchmaking system is not there to create equality or to create justice or to create balance. It is there to create as much frustration as possible. Meaning that if you are someone who has been winning games a ton, you are going to be placed with people who have been losing games a ton so that you can balance each other out. If you are someone who loses a ton, you're going to be placed with people who win a ton so as to make sure that you cannot lose as much because these same psychologists have realized that a guy who wins three times in a row and a guy who loses three times in a row both have a tendency to quit for the day meaning that they're satisfied or they're bored they are not challenged anymore but if a guy loses twice and wins twice even though he really accomplished nothing his brain is now frustrated and that frustration is going to keep him going going again for more it's again it sounds silly and you might think well there is no pleasure in that but keep in mind that the, what you pursue when you play League of Legends and what League of Legends is being designed after is not your happiness. The goal is not to make you happy. The goal is to keep you playing. So if frustration keeps you playing, guess what? The algorithm is going to actually align with that. It's why also you have things like winning cues or losing cues or smooth cues. What are these things? They are manipulations of the algorithm. If you can be made to win seven times in a row, then lose seven times in a row, guess what that breeds? Frustration, because you accomplished nothing. So you're going to keep going back for more and more and more. It is the law of variance that is just, it's, it's in nature, don't get me wrong, but that is exacerbated by the systems put in place by MOBAs. Again, on purpose, they're trying to harness that frustration to create an addiction. And this is why... Many people, me included, used to play that stupid game for 10 hours a day. And at the end of the day, you look at your league points and you didn't go anywhere. You won 10 games, you lost 10 games. You have an, a, a, a net positive of zero. Like the sum that you accumulate at the end of the day is zero league points. So why did you play in the first place? The answer is because the game sucked you in. The game keeps you, keeps you engaged via frustration. And uh, this frustration is, as I said, also, also created by the irrationality of outcomes, meaning that your faith isn't in your hands. It's what I described with the, the chess analogy. When you start a, a game of League of Legends, you don't know what you're getting. And that participates in the frustration, but also in the addiction, because it's exciting. You don't know if your teammates are going to be good. You don't know if something crazy is going to happen in the game. And therefore, you also never know how the game is going to end. It is impossible to know when a game starts, whether or not this team is going to win or this team is going to win, because too many things can happen in between. Even with pro play, pro play is more stabilized, but even then, there is instability. And that is poison to the soul. The fact that your faith is not in your hands, the fact that you have to depend on people you don't trust, and the fact that they're going to betray your trust again and again, and you're going to, to lose a ton of games because of other people, is going to participate in the frustration, a frustration that you take with you in real life. Is the reason why I quit that game is because it made me depressed. I remember playing that game, and after the game, like after five ranked games, stopping and thinking to myself, man, I was happier before I played. So why do I even play? And it's a question I ask you as well, because I know many of you are addicted to League of Legends. Why the fuck do you play? You've never went anywhere with the game. The game doesn't really make you happy anymore. So why do you still start the game every single day? What is your purpose here? Are you trying to make it pro? Because I can tell you one thing. As someone who played at a very high level, you won't make it pro. If you're someone who is stuck in gold or in plat, or you've been playing for three, four years and you're not diamond yet, you're not cut for that job, right? You're not good at the game. I know it sucks to hear, but all of the pro players are people who made it to diamond and top ranks within the first year. I was diamond within the first year I played. All of the people that I know that I played as within semi-professional teams were all also diamond within at least a year. If you are stuck underneath that, you're never going to get really good. And keep in mind one thing, even diamond is not really good. Even, even uh, GM, I think it's uh, nowadays what they call... It's this challenger, this master, yeah. Even grandmaster is not that good. It is it is not enough of an accomplishment to justify all of the sacrifices you're making, to justify the way the game makes you feel. So why do you still play it? I think you still play it because you are tilted. 
the game has you on tilt, and it's something you hear League of Legends players uh, discuss a ton, the tilt, the hint, what is this? Frustration, but that's most League players. Most League players are constantly tilted, they're constantly hinted. You know who feels that way? People with a gambling addiction. The way you feel towards League of Legends is extremely similar to a gambling addict. Do you think that it's good for you? The answer is no. Look at your relationship with the game. Look at it, what it has done to you. I can tell you for a fact that for this video, I went back to League of Legends. Not as a player, I would never touch that game again in my life because it's worse than a drug. But as a, a viewer, I watched a few streamers from France and you know what I saw? A situation even worse than when I left. I left the game because it was beyond toxic. Now this it's even worse. I watched a guy who played for, I think, like 10 games. In the 10 games, he had a guy every single time in his team who would die and then say FF. Like, FF, that's the mentality of the, of the average League of Legends player. They try something half-heartedly because they don't really want to play. They die and they lose and they just want to give up. FF means to surrender, to surrender the game. But these guys would try to surrender the game at minute one of each game. Why? They have no spirit left. And yet they still play the game. Why? They can't stop. Frust and I know maybe it's happened to you in real life. You get caught in cycles of frustration when you, you think, fuck it, I've already messed it up, so might as well just continue. But that is a snowball. It's a snowball made of shit that is just riding down the hill of your life. And it's not a joke. It's not a game. It's your life. It's what you're doing with your life. This video game is destroying your life. So if you play League of Legends, I really urge you to quit. Because it's making you a terrible person. I can tell you that for having watched these streams, the type of humans in these games are the worst type of men. The game, teach, the game teaches you to just surrender your responsibility because your faith isn't in your hands. Again, you're not really responsible. You know when people say, I'm in hell or hell? What is that? It's the renouncement of responsibility. But can you really deny it? I mean, again, there has been pro players who lost games in silver fucking rating. Why? Because they were paired with four baboons. So if you lose, yeah, it's not really your fault. But there will come a day where you will have internalized that belief so much that you'll start to apply it in real life. You'll start to think that nothing is your fault. But at some point, it is your fault. Because one day you will become the guy who is going to make your team lose. But on that day, you will have lost the self-awareness necessary to realize that you fucked up. Do you know what this means? It means that in real life, you're going to be the same. You're going to be the type of people to ne never take responsibility, to never realize your own fault, and to also never be able to improve because the only way to improve is that. And this is why League of Legends and MOBAs in general breed mediocrity. It's because they make excellence impossible. Excellence is repetition. It's being rewarded when you do well and it's being punished when you do poorly. In League of Legends, it doesn't matter. You can do horrible and be in a losing spree, be paired with four people who are going to stomp their lanes. You're going to win. Does that make you feel good? When is the last time you felt good when you won a game of League of Legends? Never. Meaning that when you, when you win, you feel neutral. And when you lose, you feel terrible. So there is literally no net positive to you playing that game. I've just proven that to you. On top of that... And I'm going to stop with that because I could really rant about this stupid game for hours. The game is designed to punish excellence, meaning that it does not want people to do good. Again, it is going to, if you are winning, to pair you with people who are losing to make sure that you cannot excel, you cannot dominate. And on top of that, they put a bounty system nowadays where if your team is doing good, the enemy team will get extra bonuses for managing to do the first thing. Like they'll take a tower and they'll get a thousand gold. That is... That is fucking garbage. It means that you are discouraged from doing good. But you know what this also does? It creates it creates cre it creates more balanced games. And you might tell me, well, it's great balanced games. No, it's not because it breeds frustration. Every single game now is going to be a fucking toss up, meaning that now you have even less of a certitude that you're going to win, even if you are a very good player. So don't do that to yourself. You're not going to make it pro. You're most likely not very good at the game. And that is fine because at the end of the day, it's a stupid game. Even the people who make a living out of it hate it and they want to quit it. So if I can give you one advice and if I can have you dodge one type of video games, it's MOBAs and it's League of Legends. After this video, right click, uninstall. Your life is going to immediately get better. Within a month, you're going to come back to this video and tell me, NH, you were so right. This game was vampirizing my life. It was just a hindrance on my life. The best 
the best fucking thing I've ever done in my life was to quit League of Legends. So that was number three. And of course, this second portion is much longer than I thought it was going to be. What time is it? Yeah, of course, it's long as fuck. Shit. All right. Give me one second. All right, so these were the three principal video games I want you to dodge. These are the worst ones. There are two other types I'm going to quickly gloss over because we don't have much time left, which are for the sandbox types of games that for the most part are Dreamwoods settings that give you absolute power. So for example, Minecraft or The Sims or that type of games that don't really offer any real restrictions or consequences to your action. You are sort of like a god and the problem is that, of course, this doesn't replicate real life. It is going to breed terrible instincts. And unlike what you might think, it's not even that great for creativity because they are based on what I call factitious creativity. Because everything is pre-generated, you don't even really create anything. You just click on icons and something happens. But because they offer a possibility to reinvent yourself, they also help you forget who you are, which is extremely tantalizing for people who don't particularly like their lives, which is why they are called sandbox types of games. They are for children. They are for people who don't really have the ability or the power to make a difference in their life. And so they are going to, in a sense, use the, the way, use the, by, the, the bypass that the medium is going to offer to them. I also want you to know that Whatever you do in these video games is impermanent, just like an MMORPG. You can spend 10,000 hours on a character or a CD or whatever creation that you want. It is, at the end of the day, just pixels and it will disappear. These are, for the most part, wasted efforts, but also wasted efforts that are installing in your head a, an anti-disciplinary type of mindset, meaning that you are experiencing a type of power you will never feel in real life, but that you could experience it in real life if you took responsibility. Because keep in mind, video games copy real life. Real life is just like video games. You can accomplish whatever you want in real life if you put in the effort, as long as you don't put in the efforts in video games. And then the last one is sports simulations. Not much to say about that. They're not that bad. It's just that they tend to replace the drive for physical activity because you play sports in online on your video game and therefore it sort of replaces that need and also tends to encourage you to live vicariously through the players you're going to embody which tend to not also foster the most anabolic types of lifestyles it's something you see a lot with a sports fan especially soccer fans when they tend to not be, they tend to be out of shape they tend to not even partake in the sport that they watch and all of that is very strange and suspicious like all of these dudes that I see on Sunday afternoons with their beer guts who watch, who watch football and who scream at the TV. And I'm there asking myself, uh, what are you doing? Like, you should be physically active. Why are you spending all of your energy watching other men be physically active? There is something extremely deranged in that. And it's the same with the video games that replicate that. So this is for the five types of video games that must be avoided at all costs. If you play them, I can tell you for a fact that cutting them out of your life would be a net positive, meaning that you would be immediately uh, better off not playing them at all. This is the one absolute where I'll tell you that I don't really even see a reason why you should be playing them. But of course, these are the most popular types of game because they are the most addictive for the reasons I already explained. They are built to be addictive. If you can realize that, you can also realize that most likely this addiction is not to your benefit. It's to the benefit of the person who created the game and makes money out of it, which is also why these games are the ones that make the most money off of microtransactions. It's because you're already addicted. So they can also have you pay for their products because your mind is already in the right state for that. So this was for the negative. Now we're going to talk about the positive because as I said, video games to me are an art form and therefore they can have the ability to develop positive traits. So here are five types of video games that are very light on the negatives and can help develop positive character traits who are not going to include any of the things that I described in the first part of the video. The first one is RPGs. RPGs that are not online, that are finite, so there's a start and an end, have a tendency to encourage exploration and contemplation. 
being that it's a more relaxed type of experience. It's also something that is going to have an end, right? It has an end. The, the big issue with MMORPGs, and it's the nuance in my video and world, is that everything that an RPG does that is positive, the MMORPG is going to be doing negatively because there is no end in sight. It's a never-ending chase. If you tell me you're going to run from point A to point B, that's great, that, that's good exercise, it's good for you. But if you tell me, hey, I'll run from point A to point infinity, now it's a problem, you're going to die of exhaustion. It's not going to be a good fitness activity anymore. It's going to be a death pact. Same here. An RPG that has a clearly defined end can be a good adventure because it has an end. This is the difference between infinite, uh, infinite and finite settings. You always want to favor finite settings when you pick a video game. That is a rule of thumb. Also, RPGs have a tendency to teach you about economy and resource management because you have to gather stuff, you have to create certain equipment, you have to look at your gold. All of that in a vacuum is, is very good. I would even say that for a teenager, it can teach very valuable skill if it's not poisoned by the rest. And the rest can be, for example, the inclusion of infinite quests. So there are many RPGs that try to be MMORPGs where they have you go from this place to this place and there's a thousand quests. All of that is mostly useless. All of that is mostly repetitive grind. And I've already told you that this is dangerous. It also tends to lead to what I have coined collectionism, which is the endless collection of useless items in the games. You don't even really know why you're doing it. You're not having fun doing it, but you're doing it because that's that's just what you do now. And modern RPGs tend to do that a ton, where they have a thousand side missions that don't really mean anything, add nothing to the plot, and are boring, but you do them because it's just a mechanism of behavior. It's just an, a habit that you have developed. So any type of RPGs that have these traits need to be avoided because they're bad. RPGs that are harmless tend in opposition to be the ones who are with a high threshold of difficulty and with not a lot of time, uh, time investment needed. So the RPG might take you 30 hours to complete. That is great because 30 hours is not that much. Again, keep in mind that MMORPGs for the most part, it's thousands of hours minimum. That's the bare minimum to be able to even play the game. RPGs cannot do that because you'd get bored and you'd leave for the most part. So they have to give you a clear goal in mind and that is what is making them good. They're self-contained. Also, they're possible. I'm sure that this is creating PTSD attacks in your brain because you, we've all had our mom scream, hey, pause the game, but it's an online game and we can pause it and your mom is now mad. She didn't know why, but she was mad for a reason. The fact that you cannot pause the game is the sign that the game is most likely dangerous for you. And you will find that in my list, every single game that cannot be paused tends to be a bad game. It tends to not be beneficial for your development as a man. Whereas RPGs that are possible are good because you control the time you put in them. You decide when you start and you decide when you end. This is incredibly valuable because you might be someone like me who has an addictive personality and who, when he starts playing a video game, only ends when the game tells you to end. The issue is that all of the games from the, the, pre, the previous list have no ends. You can play them non-stop. You can play them until you literally die in your chair. While an RPG, for the most part, there is a save point, there is a boss, there is a certain part in the plot where it justifies a break, etc. So it makes it much more manageable, and it's why I recommend playing them. For example, take the Dark Souls games. Good luck playing fucking Dark Souls 10 hours in a row. The difficulty is very high. It's something that is full of exploration and secrets. And usually you play two hours and you're satiated and you can put the game down and come back the next day. This is good. This is the type of game that you actually want to be playing if you still want to be playing video games. The next one is the RTS genre, which has a tendency to develop dexterity and reflexes because it's very high APM. They also tend to teach about strategy and history, which is always good to take. And they are high mental fatigue and responsibility, the two paired together, because an RTS, unlike a MOBA, is you against someone else. So if you, if you lose, you cannot blame someone else. You have to take responsibility, and therefore there is almost no frustration in it. If there is frustration, it's frustration towards your own weakness and no, not towards causality or fatality, which makes it much healthier. 
also high mental fatigue. Unlike League of Legends, that is really a game, again, for brainlets, where it's... You can crank out 20 games a day, it doesn't matter. It's going to depress the fuck out of you, but in terms of brain capacity, it doesn't take that much, because the game is not that complicated to play. There's four fucking spells. In RTSs, you'll play three games, like high-paced, high-stress games, and you're going to call it quits. And that's it. You spend 40 minutes playing, and you're good for the day. That is a good amount of its investment to put in a video game. Platformers are sort of the same, meaning that they are generally also very high-paced, but they are high-paced in bursts. The reason why I don't like shooters is because they are high-paced all the fucking time, which puts your anxiety and ADHD through the roof. A platformers will have certain segments that are going to be very high-paced, that are going to have you very engaged. But after that, it goes back to normal. It's like real life. Real life is not an endless peak. It's mountains and valleys. It does this. Platformers in RRD are after nature, and therefore they are much healthier. Also, they are low on the addiction scale, because I don't know a single person that's addicted to Mario, right? Platformers simply do not have the ability to tap into that, that biological male instinct that you have up there, because even though you do collect things, and even, you, even though you will actually go save a princess, it's not articulated after the achievements you can actually provide for yourself in real life. So, whether it was actually wanted or not by the people who develop platformers, they are actually very low on the addiction scale, and they also tend to develop spatial awareness and curiosity, because there's always something you can discover if you go behind that building, etc. Which is why, if I were to give one type of game that is actually very good for children to play, it's platformers. Not fucking sandbox games. Look at the generation that grew up playing Minecraft. The kids are now the ones that you see that are starting to reach the age of maturity. And I'm not impressed by what I'm seeing. The Minecraft generation has mostly bred idiots. So, platformers, good. Sandbox games, bad. Fourth one, Puzzler. I mean, this one goes without saying. The Puzzle-type games tend to boost adaptive intelligence because they are mostly based on your ability to actually look at a problem and solve it. It's also something that is going to bolster reasoning skills because you can't brute force a puzzler game. You either have the solution or you don't. You cannot beat up the Sphinx. You cannot, you cannot shoot it in the face. You have to find the one solution and that's it. So you have to adapt to the game and the game is not going to adapt to you and that's extremely good. Because it breeds positive frustration. If you cannot solve a mystery or enigma, it's not the fault of the game, it's not the fault of the wood or of your teammates, it is your fault. And this is something that is going to make you better. There are also low anxiety, high focus games because it's low stakes, it's, it's a very slow pace, and it forces you to actually focus on something intently, which can be beneficial for your ADHD, because it's not explosions, it's not the camera moving at 330,000 miles an hour, it's like one scene that's not moving at all, and you have to focus on details. It is great. And the last one of the types of video games that I think are good for you is party games, because there is a social element to them. They are high confrontation, high cooperation type games, so they link you with people for real, which also makes them anti-parasocial, because most of the time you play these games with people you know in real life, and if you do not do that, you play them with online people, the relationship you will have with them playing the game is much more, is much closer to what would actually happen in real life. Again, because you'll have to cooperate or you have to enter a competition with them, but without shooting each other in the face or without being elves of the night or whatever the fuck, raiding somewhere, it's going to be based on board games for the most part that take very low skill caps, so there's no time investment needed, and therefore you don't have to sink in a ton of time. As you've seen with the five games I already de uh, detailed, the number one thing that I'm looking at is how much time you're going to have to put in the game. For the most part, the most time the game requires you to put in, the worse it is because video games should not be something that you spend too much time doing. I'm going to give an arbitrary number here, but an hour a day, maybe two hours on the weekend, but not more than that. 
for me, if you spend more hours a week playing video games than you play, than you spend training, you are doing something very wrong. And the same goes for any other type of distractions. If you spend more time watching YouTube, watching TV, or whatever, then you spend training your body or your mind, your mind also works, then you are missing the plot. Because this, these games, yes, develop the mind, but not as much as you would think. I see too many people who say, oh, it's like reading a book. It's not. I'm sorry, it's not. Some games are, some RPGs are, but your first person shooter is not like reading a book. Your MOBA is especially not like reading a book. For all of the reasons I already described, a book is not doing that for you. All of the negatives that I outlined, a book doesn't do that. So if there is development in terms of the spiritual when you play video games, it is for the most part going to be in a downward spiral. It's going to make you worse spiritually. And if it does make a, a, a net positive, it is a positive change. It's going to be mainly because you played one of the five types of video games I just outlined and you play them in moderation. So that is going to conclude the segment about the five types to avoid and the five times to favor. Keeping in mind that the best of the best would be to not play video games, but I know that some of you love them so much that you don't want to give them up entirely and therefore you should prefer and favor the ones that, in my opinion, are going to have more of a positive impact than a negative impact. Because I understand that video games can be great tools to relax, but only in a finite and controlled amount. You control the amount of time you play video games. If you catch yourself playing a video game longer than you wanted, it's because the video game made you do it through its mechanisms and therefore it's not good. You have lost control. Control is everything because most of the energy you spend on games, you should have been spending on something else and preferably you should be spending on training. If you're the type of person like me, who used to be addicted to video games, who might still be addicted, I can tell you one thing. The solution and the cure, and the cure is to be found in training. I made a video about that a long time ago. It's in the description for you to watch. But keep in mind that this transfer of addiction from video games to lifting is going to make all of the difference because the issue with video games is that you can play them for an infinite amount of times. There is no limiting factor. Nothing is going to tell you in your mind or spirit that you have to stop. And so you will be wasting your life away. While training, you can only train for a finite amount of time. But if you do embrace training, you will be able to return to video games at some point if you so desire with a much healthier approach because now you are going to use them as a way to recover. It is great to sit down and play a video game and be st stagnant for an hour a day to recover after your training, to just relax. But if it starts to replace the time you should have spent training, now it's a problem. Now it's what I've described throughout this video where the life that you spend in the video game ends up replacing your real life. And that is simply not something that we want. It's simply not something you, that we have to deem acceptable. It's something that needs to be combated. And this is why, for all of the reasons I already outlined, I believe that you, stop, that you should stop playing video games. And if you choose not to, I hope that you're going to take my advice into account and that you're going to modify the way you approach them because I believe that it's going to be of, of great benefit to your life. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.